Hello viewers, um, wherever you're watching in the world. Uh, my name's Indigo and for this next hour I'll be talking to some members of the Stay Grounded Network, um, Bristol Airport Action Network, Plan B and Extinction Rebellion as they discuss mobilising communities, taking action and changing the law. With over 1,200 airport infrastructure projects planned worldwide, and CO2 emissions from commercial flights rising 70% faster than predicted by the UN, preventing this industry from expanding can feel impossible. Many people are concerned about the warming of the earth and are wondering, how do we stop these monstrous companies expanding and taking over our skies? Um, the coronavirus pandemic has lim may limit global air traffic to 50 to 60% of normal levels by the end of the year, but with the planned government bailout strategies, it's possible that this industry makes a full recovery. Um, to, date, to date, governments have devoted more than 85 billion to propping up these airlines. So um, we have a chance to shape how we rebuild after this pandemic, um, a chance to reflect on how people have managed to organise communities, what direct action they've taken, and how they've taken the industry, aviation industry to courts. Um, I'm joined by James Brown, the ex-Paralympian who made the headlines across the world um, when he got on top of a plane at City Airport. Callum, who is a researcher and Stay Grounded campaigner, and Tim Crosland, Extinction Rebellion activist and member of Plan B, um, which is one of the, yeah, and Tarisha Finnegan Clark, who's Bristol XR Rebel, psychotherapist, and coordinator of Bristol Airport Action Network that set out to stop the expansion and on February the 10th, 2020, succeeded. Um, so that's that's enough from me really. I'm going to um, I'm going to first speak to uh, James. Sorry, everyone, my screen. Um, um, yeah, James, how how are you? Um, have you been up to some action this weekend? Uh, Last, last Reset TV call, we were speaking to cyclists about taking to the streets to reclaim the city with bike lanes. Well, <clears throat> indeed, uh, funny you should ask that. Um, as some may know, um, one of my Paralympic sports was cycling, so it was lovely on Sunday to be able to get out on the streets of Exeter uh, for a sort of mass, partici mass participation bike ride with um, safe distancing and so on, and uh, it really kind of showed um, what we're going to have to do to be able to create safe city and town spaces for pedestrians and cyclists in the future. Yes, yeah, so was that the first time you've been out since the lockdown? Did it feel like breaking the ice a bit? It's the first time I've been out on the bike, yep, yeah. um, and uh, it certainly felt like um, felt like we are kind of slowly coming out of the lockdown, so yeah. Yeah. Um, now, the story that everyone knows you for is um, when you got on top of a plane at City Airport. Can you tell us a little bit about that action? Yeah, um, of course, one is advised uh, when one has a, an impending court case to say as little as possible. But um, I think I can safely talk about the stuff that's kind of out in public arena on numerous uh, live streams and other videos and, and so on. Um, so yeah, on the, oh, I can't remember, the 10th of October, something like that, last year, uh, there was a, an action uh, at the um, London City Airport as part of the autumn uprising. Um, some of us who took part in the uh, particular action at the airport had uh, tickets so that we could um, go through the security and so on to airside. Um, this is where I need to kind of be a little bit careful, but whatever transpired uh, saw me um, on top of a British Airways plane, um, taking literally um, the kind of, you know, we say we're going to get on a flight to, to Amsterdam, we don't say I'm going to get in a flight, so I kind of took that out a little bit literally and um, got on the roof of the plane. Um, from where I did a, a live stream, um, and really, I think, spoke to anybody who was watching to say, this is, this is why I'm doing this. And um, 
uh, yeah, it, it seemed to capture the imagination of many, I think. And, and what did it feel like being stood on board a British Airways plane? Um, well, I, I actually sat on, I didn't, I wasn't brave enough to stand on the roof. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's scary. Um, but, uh, you know, I want to say a little thing about fear because, you know, if, if we are not afraid of what the scientists are telling us about the climate and nature emergency or climate and ecological crisis, whichever way you want to word it, if we're not terrified, then we're not paying attention. So the fear that I experienced on top of the plane was absolutely nothing compared to the fear that I have inside me for the future, for my children and for all the children and all the species of the planet. So I think um, there were other, there were other uh, elements about that action as well, and uh, which I think probably maybe worth drawing attention to, you know, maybe people were interested in it because I was scared and because I said I was scared. Um, but I also think that in order to uh, do what's necessary to avert the worst effects uh, of the impending crisis or the crisis that's actually with us right now, we're going to have to be brave. We're going to have to be innovative. We're going to have to say, let's do things differently. And let's do things in a way that we may never have thought before. We may not have had the ideas. We may not have thought they were possible. Um, so there was a bit of an analogy there because I, I don't know if anybody had ever climbed on top of a plane before, but so it was, as, it, as well as it being a protest about aviation, it's also kind of a, a bit of a demonstration, if only to myself, to say, yeah, do you know what? Um, you know, the, it, it, it is possible to, um, to, to be brave. It's possible to innovate. It's possible to come up with new ideas. And I, I think that's, that's a, an important lesson, really, for the, the wider crisis as well. Yeah, I think that's a really important lesson and I can't imagine how that must have felt to get on top of that plane. And similar actions I can think that have happened like within relatively recent years, there was a group of people who stopped a flight in Heathrow uh, to bring attention to the expansion and a group of people in who got on the runway in Stansted to bring attention to a deportation charter flight. Um, and I'm thinking, what were your motivations for getting on top of the plane at City Airport? Uh, for me, for me, it's really straightforward um, and uncomplicated, especially aviation. Um, the fact of the matter is we um, are in a crisis. Uh, our governments aren't taking necessary action, therefore we must uh, do it ourselves and we must put pressure on the government, uh, on, on all governments or around the world. Um, so protest is one way of, uh, of, of doing that. But um, the, it, it's so clear that aviation is a fairly big polluter. Um, and there are lots of arguments about the extent of the pollution caused by aviation. And I'm sure those who are more informed on the science will, will, will maybe speak about that later. But it's, it's, it's widely accepted that aviation is a major contributor to global heating. Um, and the point about it is that it, it can't at the moment be decarbonized. And, you know, some of these airports have in their sustainability strategies um, quite a lot of stuff about offsetting. But that just doesn't, uh, doesn't cut it any longer. I think we all know that offsetting isn't uh, a viable route. And it's just passing the buck, really. The, the point is aeroplanes simply can't become uh, environmentally friendly until we have solar powered electric ones and that's not going to be for a very long time. So the logical conclusion of that without making any judgments is that we, if we are to create a habitable future on this planet for our kids and for the other species on the planet, we're going to have to reduce aviation. It's really simple. and. Um, yeah, I, I don't see why it has to be any more complicated than that. We're going to have to reduce lots of things. And it, it doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to go on holiday. It doesn't mean we're not going to be able to live in houses with TVs and stuff, you know, um, and that we're not going to be able to travel. We just have to think more carefully about how we do it. Um, so where, where are you going on holiday this year? 
you have any plans when this lifts, if you're not going to jet set off to, uh, to Australia? No, no, no. I haven't been on a plane. Well, sorry, I've been on a plane literally um, last September for an hour and a bit. Uh, it's an incident we're talking about, but I haven't actually been in a plane and gone anywhere for a very, very long time, probably about three years. And I, I intend never again to go on a plane. So holiday wise, um, not really got any plans. I mean, uh, with this weather we've got at the moment, um, we, you know, it's just it's just beautiful just to be outside. And I've also developed a, a great love of of nature and trees. Um, I've been following the HS2 Stop HS2 project, and, and part of that uh, for me has uh, been involved taking up a new skill of tree climbing. So I've been enjoying quite a lot of tree climbing recently. Gosh, you're you're unstoppable, and. Um... You spoke a bit about the fear, but you're also a partially sighted rebel. And I think many people would think that's a, a big barrier to things like getting on top of planes or climbing trees outside Euston Station to bring attention to the HS2 project. Can you just talk about a bit about like how you how you overcome that extra barrier to participation? Well, uh, yeah, I guess there's a psychological aspect of it, which is that, that I, I guess I, I, I have through my life become quite determined and quite resilient. And you know, there, there is quite a lot of evidence that says um, disabled people are very good at problem solving because we kind of have to do it on a daily basis because we do face challenges and barriers that uh, others don't. So uh, there's an element of sort of um, problem solving skill, um, resilience, uh, determination. Um, but then, in, you know, in practical terms, um, I usually find ways around things. Um, and I probably can't, again, say too much about the plane incident, but it, it actually wasn't that difficult. Unfortunately, I've been on far too many planes in my life. When I was a, you know, through being an athlete, I think I've probably flown nearly a thousand times, I hate to confess, but that was before I knew the harm that I was doing. And, and I think that brings up an important point, if I may just throw it in, which is that, that you know, the whole my, my whole assessment of the the predicament we're in is that we've jointly made a catastrophic mistake um there is evidence coming out that some knew of this catastrophic mistake that we were making and did nothing about it so i'm talking about some of the uh, uh, executives of oil companies etc cetera, etc cetera. um but generally speaking um most of the rest of the global population um, has been relatively unaware of um, the extent to which we are destroying the planet. So once that information is out there, which it is now, I don't see why everybody isn't um, uh, studying it, understanding it, and working out what it is they can contribute to the solutions. Yeah. And it's not that we are just sort of leaving it be, it's that as we come out of this time, we're going to actively prop up that, um, that industry. So um, there's lots of amazing campaigning happening across NGOs and local communities and organising, but what, what do you have any plans if, they do, if, if, if the powers that be do choose to give these huge bailouts to the aviation sector in the UK? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll give one example. I mean, I don't want to say too much about planned um, aviation-specific actions, um, but certainly they do exist, um, as I understand. Um, but what I will share is that I, I have an ongoing um, co correspondence with Stelios, who's the founder of EasyJet. The reason I, he and I know one another is that I was a lucky winner of, um, he, he runs an annual award scheme for disabled entrepreneurs. Uh, I run a charity called Mobilu, which is uh, a, a, a mobile toilet service for disabled people. Um, and I was one of the winners of, of the Stelios Award a couple of years ago. So, um, you know, we've, we've spent time together, we've talked, and, and I wrote to him recently and said, Stelios, it doesn't make sense that you're taking the £60 million dividend and then asking the government for a bailout, for EasyJet. What, what are you doing? Um, and he replied, um, in a convoluted way, blaming Airbus, um, and I, I couldn't really understand how that was. Um, so I've written back to him again with another proposal, which is that he grounds all of his flights permanently, and pointing out to him the benefits to him in terms of sort of global re global recognition for having vision, and you know he could become really well known as the first guy to do this. And 
you know, if that's his motive, motivation in life, then, then I, I don't understand why he doesn't do it. And I've even offered to give the £10,000 prize money back to him. And like, I don't understand why he wouldn't accept that offer. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's, another, there's another bit of the offer. Um, no, I can't mention it. No, don't you say anything you shouldn't. It doesn't, it last, doesn't getting on top of one of his plans anyway. Last quick question is that, do you, you, know, do you have any tips for rebels at home planning, planning an action? Uh, yeah, definitely. And I'm really glad you asked that question. Um, you know, being an activist is really hard. Um, no matter how resilient or experienced you are, it takes a massive emotional toll um, because you're facing tough opposition all the time. Um, you're facing the criminal justice system, you're facing, in the case of um, especially the, the HS2 guys, protests, they're facing physical violence um, from the national eviction team and the HS2 uh, employed security. It's really hard. The, the most important thing I would say um, when planning an action is get the well-being right first and you know, take care of one another make sure somebody in the team is specifically focusing on that and doesn't have any other distractions and that they're constantly in touch with everybody who's taking part in the action as much as possible just to check in on the well-being and that involves that includes not just the the activists who are, who are going out on the front line but also you know the, the, the background team as well I think I think um, looking after ourselves, caring for each other, and, and you know, um, using our infinite capacity for compassion, because um, that's what we're gonna need, and it is there, we have it, it's unlimited, and to share that compassion amongst our fellow rebels and activists, I think, is the most important part of putting an action together. Great, thank you, James. And um, anyone listening at home on Facebook or Twitter, if you can, um, if you have any questions to any of our panelists you can put them in the comments chat and we'll try to reach some of those at the end um next we have callum who is part of the stay grounded network um callum can you give us a bit of a background on on all of this like what what is the scale of aviation expansion um projects in the uk and worldwide what are we up against what are we facing um hi yeah um yeah really happy to be here with you uh today um so in the UK, the, uh, there's been a lot of focus um, on um, on Heathrow as the sort of uh, the sort of main airport expansion project in the UK for the last few years, and that's because it's it's enormous. Uh, it's a, the biggest airport in the UK. It's one of the biggest carbon emitters um, in any sector. Um, but in reality, pretty well every airport, um, and I've got a little slide just to show here. Um, uh, pretty well every airport um, across the country has a master plan um, for expansion um, and and they kind of vary in scale but um, by and large they all have an agenda uh, which is to, to grow and to increase flights and passenger numbers um, and in lots of cases build new runways um, so there's, there's a, yeah, it's not by no means is it just Heathrow that, um, that we're up against um, it's sort of it's becoming more and more of a regional struggle, and we're sort of going to hear some, uh, about uh, some of those from uh, Trisha, um later. I think talking about Bristol, but there's there's that and Stansted and all sorts of other um, local airports are coming up um, and becoming more prominent. Um, but around the world, it's it's sort of even even worse. There's uh, there's airports and and runways. All over the all over the planet that are that are either new or planning to uh, expand. Um, there's about 1,200, as I think you said earlier, in the uh, projects that, that plan to expand airports at the moment. Um, but just with new airports and runways, there's there's over 400 new runways planned at the moment around the world, um, and over 100 additional runways in, at existing airports. And then on top of that, there's about another six or seven hundred airports that are planning to expand in one way or another, build new terminals, um, you know, generally increase capacity. Um, so there's, there's there's a huge amount, th th this industry has, has no plans to kind of cut back or limit itself at all. There's, uh, it plans to expand and, and quite aggressively. And, and what do you think is the problem with aviation expansion? Why, why, sh why should communities sort of um, begin campaigns of resistance against these expansion? We could just have more holidays and more business flights, but 
what 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 other problems that we're seeing with this expansion so the thing with aviation is it's it's extreme in a lot of ways it'd be hard really to to invent it's a, even in fiction it would be hard to fictionalize a, a sort of dirty industry that was more kind of bent on profit and and regards the disregarding of of any other limitations um i mean so just i mean as a starter there's um uh, the climate impact is the sort of first place to start, and um, so the climate impact of flying is 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 much greater than than any other form of transport per per passenger kilometre. Um, it just far exceeds it because you know you're, you're not just taking a bus; you're taking a bus up to thirty thousand feet and uh, trying to make it fly. So it's just there's a huge amount more energy involved, and as a result, a huge amount more um, more fuel burnt and more, more carbon emitted. Um, and that's exacerbated can, by the fact. Can you read us through that last slide there? So, what's yeah. the difference if I sort of take um, a bus, a bus to um, Paris as opposed to a flight? What, what sort of? How so much the uh, so I guess it's worth oh sorry it's worth saying that the, the numbers are you know these are sort of one version of numbers and the numbers sort of do vary from place to place but broadly um, it's you know nearly nearly 10 times worse to, to fly rather than take the bus you know roughly so roughly speaking in terms of energy according to these numbers um and and that's based on sort of normal sort of occupancy rates again so but um it's it's using far more energy to to fly at altitude um than you are um to, to, to get in a bus or get on a train and, and trains are you know, really as you can see from this really really low impact uh in terms of energy used to per person because you get lots of people in a, in a train carriage um, and, uh, and, it, and it, especially when they're electrified they take a, very little energy to run um, compared to, to flights which are obviously flights are also kind of limited in the sense that you can you can only get so many people in a plane whereas with a train you can more easily have new add more carriages uh, and expand capacity much more easily as demand goes up um, there's various reasons why particularly trains do really well on these metrics and, and they are just more efficient um, but flights are, you know, are, have fixed capacity, um, but uh, they also just take a lot more energy. Um, and that, that's sort of exacerbated by, um, uh, and the, the reason it's, it's so much more, so it's just to be clear, so this, that, that number is not just because of the fuel, but the, the, the fact that you're burning this fuel at altitude means that it has a greater heating effect uh, on the planet. So. Um, because there's, there's other sort of atmospheric processes and other gases involved, such as uh, nitrous oxides, um, water vapor, and, and uh, methane, and things, and the fact that it's at thirty thousand feet, um, basically, probably there's a bit of uncertainty, but pretty much doubles the effect um, of, of the heating um, compared to you know burning it in your car at ground level. Um, so that that also means that that aviation just has a huge that, that, that's you know that's why that this the numbers here are 10 times greater in a to fly rather than go by bus it's just it's just an enormous difference because of you're using more energy and every you know liter of fuel you burn at 30,000 feet has twice the effect of a liter you burn in your car um so so that, that means that aviation and this is where, where there's often some confusion when people talk about statistics and the um the industry is very keen to talk about carbon emissions mm -hmm. because that just measures you know, the, the kilos or tons of carbon emitted. Um, activists are very keen to talk about uh, the sort of climate impact or the, the forcing or any of these sort of terms which, which try to take into account um, how much aviation contributes to global heating, you know, with all these effects taken in. And, and there's some uncertainty in the science, but it roughly, if you, if you account for all the effects, Aviation is roughly responsible for well, it's between five and eight percent of, of global heating, um, which is much more than the sort of two to four percent that the industry like to talk about when they talk about the carbon mm. emissions. And I think <laughs> what we're seeing there, isn't it, that so just to so I understand that because it's being emitted higher up, it's having worse effects on our climate. And this sort of three five percent, to be honest, it doesn't sound like very much. We think all of those flights doesn't sound very much, but what is troubling is that it's one of the fastest growing sectors and it's predominantly used by the um, ri richer percentage of the population, I suppose. So if we started to see everybody um, using flights in this way, 
well, I suppose it, it could have catastrophic effects. Exactly. Yeah. So the, and that's exactly right. So because, because it's, because aviation is, is, is relatively expensive, it, it's, it's, you know, there are, in the UK, it can sometimes seem that flights seem quite cheap, but, but globally speaking, flying is expensive. Um, and and yeah, and, and actually, even in the UK, a very small percentage, um, the, the sort of top ten percent of people in the UK, th these are not UK, uh, these are not UK figures, but it, it's they're roughly roughly similar. You know, top ten percent in terms of income and, and uh, sort of wealth are responsible for about half of flights. Um, so you get a small minority taking taking you know a, a, a large amount of the flights. Um, and therefore, that yeah, this industry is not only super polluting, but it's also serving disproportionately serving a, a small minority of, of really well-off people. Um, and these are well-off people who, who, as a result, also have huge, huge carbon and uh, sort of carbon footprints. Um, and yeah, so that sort of um, those things. The, the as, as James mentioned earlier, the other um, key thing um, uh, is that aviation is really difficult to decarbonize. With, with trains, you can make them electric. With uh, buses, there's also other options, whether it's electric or, or hydrogen, or there's, there's potential at least to, to decarbonize ground transport. With planes, it's it's really tough. Um, and we've seen at the moment, uh, Rolls Royce sort of abandoned their hybrid electric uh, sort of research project in the last few weeks that they were uh, carrying out with Airbus. You know, it's it's just, you know especially at times like this, it's getting sort of harder just because there's all the economic uncertainty um, and, and the options that the, the industry is pursuing include carbon offsets and biofuels and we can get into them more in more detail if people want to but uh, they're kind of both quite sort of they're both rabbit holes that we could disappear down but in short carbon offsets don't reduce the carbon dioxide coming out of the back of an engine right they, they, they reduce emissions they try and reduce emissions somewhere else so that you st you're still left with the problem that you're still emitting the same amount of carbon, whether you offset or not, and that's a problem for our climate. The climate still gets hotter. With biofuels, there's there's really quite serious concerns about their sustainability at the moment, and they just you know producing them at scale um, has is is a, looks like quite dangerous from a perspective of of increasing demand for for things like palm oil as feedstock. So. They're both quite problematic, um, and the, the the final reason that, that aviation is so kind of um, is, is such a problem is that it's also exempt from most sort of carbon budgets. It's kind of managed to because it's a global industry quite inherently. It's managed to stay outside of any national, really in, in pretty much every country, any national carbon budgets or carbon limitations. Um, so in the UK, we only include our domestic aviation, which is about four percent of flights in the UK uh, in our carbon budgets. So 96% of, of flights are totally outside of our, our legally binding carbon uh, targets in the UK. And that's a big problem if, we, if we're serious about getting to net zero by 2050, or, or real zero really, um, we need to be looking at all emissions. We can't be excluding uh, a highly polluting, rapidly growing um, industry um, in the fortune of aviation. Um, yeah, so that's and um the last question for now is um the organization these slides are from stay grounded um what who are you what 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 do you do what are you campaigning for um so stay ground is a, a fairly young network of um it's about two three four years old um of 150 local groups so it's, we're kind of getting more members all the time but um local groups around the world resisting airport expansion local to them um and so we are very expressly in favour of um, campaigning and collaborating and, and for sort of direct action and building for system change and have, and basically pushing for, for a just sustainable transport system. And we have a smaller emphasis on on individual action and, and behaviour change, but it, we're sort of primarily focused on on system change. Um, and we we basically try and try and bring just facilitate communication between groups um, and that whether that's sharing information or tactics. Um, and and collaborating on on actions and we've done a few sort of um simultaneous actions around the world uh, to try and build and work together and build that sort of turn the volume up at a, a sort of global scale um 
and then we've also done some research research type work into uh, into biofuels and, and offsets and the problems and also then into the more positive what are, what are the policy solutions that we can we can actually grab and run with for uh, for actually tackling aviation for trying to degrow the industry um, and we've we've got papers on our, our websites about that for people want to delve a bit deeper great that, thank you Callum that's that's great um, and we'll hear a bit more later from you for a plan of how we how we can start networking here in the UK um, Tarisha, um, I want to uh, ask you a bit about what you've been up to in Bristol and um, how you did manage that great success quite recently resisting the expansion there um, Tarisha, sorry you're if you can unmute your mic, thanks. So hello everyone. So um, I'm just really happy to be here. So I'm the coordinator of the Bristol Airport Action Network Group. Um, um, and that might um, give the impression that I worked on my own or there was only a, num a small number of us involved in the action that happened in Bristol. But in fact, um, it was very much a collective. It was very much a gathering under the under the net under the umbrella of a network. Um, XR and I am I am from XR. There was a lot of um, direction and thought coming from Extinction Rebellion, um, but within our network were the other environmental groups that were involved in North Somerset. And there were the lo very small parishes that were dotted all over North Somerset. So you might say, why North Somerset if it's Bristol Airport? Well, Bristol Airport is based in um, North Somerset um, Planning Department um, Council. So although we were based, a lot of um, the activists were based in Bristol, we had to network with the, uh, with the people that were in North Somerset. It's a much more rural area. Um, and so this, um, it became a campaign where we started reaching out to the communities all over North Somerset um, and the adjoining counties as well. Um, so it became a movement within movements. The strategy group, um, so we spit the network was um, directed by, not directed, but the ideas about where we might be putting our energy at any one time was coming from this strategy group. And that strategy group was about um, 20 people. Um, there was about 20 people in that. And we'd meet every two weeks and decide on what was the main um, focus for the upcoming um, campaign. And let me ask a quick question here for people who don't know, what was, what did Bristol Airport plan? What were they planning to do to the airport? Um, mm. So they were planning to expand their passengers um, by 2 million, which means 23,600 extra flights a year. 10,000 extra car movements a day um, going to and from the airport. So the extra flights, just the extra flights, um, using the calculation that Callum spoke about, carbon and NOx, um, created 1 million, um, extra, 1 million tons of carbon, extra carbon. Now to put that in perspective, the whole of Bristol, the whole of the internal carbon emissions for the whole of Bristol is 1.5 million a year. So, and the hot, uh, and because we were based, you know, the airports in North Somerset, their internal emissions for the whole of 100,000 people that live there is a million um, tons. So the extra 2 million passengers was equivalent to the whole, <laughs> of the internal workings of that county and I think you know Callum was saying this is a really dirty industry there is no way it's so far um, beyond control that you know that we need to you know really look at stopping um, this industry um, from expanding and to even make it 
smaller, much smaller than it actually is. Yeah, so back to how, how, how did you organise the community to um, build this really strong campaign? What did you, what were the steps? So within the network that was meeting every two weeks, um, th they were all networked out to other groups. So for instance, we had someone there who was leading the parishes of North Somerset, um, Hilary Byrne, who was um, in, connect, in contact with all the other parishes within North Somerset. So whatever decisions were being taken, because um, we might be said, so the, so the airport, for instance, might have said, we've got a carbon neutral road plan, and they might be splashing that all over the media. So we, in the, in the strategy group, right, we would focus on, the, on a derailing that misinformation. So we would be thinking of actions to do and um, uh, media to write, um, staging a non-violent um, um, direct action. Um, we would be thinking of these things in order to sort of get that message out that, that this was not true. Uh, and the reason why we were doing that was um, in North Somerset, the planning department was made up of 27 councillors. Um, and we decided very early on that we weren't going to fight the airport because the airport and the management within the airport were never going to change their minds. Um, and, you know, by going, we did go down to the airport at the beginning, and I've got some pictures to show. So we did go down to the airport at the beginning and we, and of course, you know, um, that was reported. But in terms of how that might be viewed by the councillors and by passengers using that airport, we, we could get lots of negative press from that. So what we did, whatever we did, we wanted to always tell the truth and get a really positive um, message across. So when we thought of an action, we thought about, we always thought, how will this impact on the councillors? What will they make of it? So we went through their eyes to, and then we developed um, our actions with that in mind because they were going to vote wh whether it was going to go through or not. Um, so what actions did you take? What actions did the group plan? Where were they and who, who took part? Uh, there were so many. Um, and again, I think this is one thing that um, we've, we've uh, drawn it all out. And it's, <laughs> there are so many, but we never knew at the time that it would go on for a year. We would always try to delay. We played a cat and mouse game in terms of... Um, Every time the airport put something in the um, paper through, we um, put our paper through saying that's not tr that's not true. So it, it it there were loads, there were hundreds of actions that took place over that year. The the twenty people who were networked would go away and they would network into their group and they would think of the actions. So there was lots of different actions coming from Bristol and from North Somerset all the time so that we weren't getting burnt out. It was never, it was, I wouldn't say never the same people. There were lots and lots of different people involved all the time with a steady core of people who held it in the middle, who held the campaign together, the shape of the campaign together. So if I show you some pictures, it, this is some of the actions. Um, let's hope this works now. Have you got that one? Yeah, that's great. Okay, so this is um, the famous Clifton Bridge and these letters are very, very big indeed. There's 19 letters there and it took about um, 20 or 20 of us all day to make those letters. Wow, that's a great picture. <laughs> and that was uh, reported in The Guardian as well because it's such um, uh, iconic. 
so this is right at the beginning as well. So City, um, Lon City of London Airport and Bristol Airport are owned by the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund. And this is back in April when we were down in London for the rebellion. We went outside the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund's offices and stopped <laughs> Baker Street. At the time, this is very early on in our campaign, there was only about 25 of us and some people had never done an action before um, and it was their first action. So, um, and having said that, so this action took place, we wrote to them, we wrote to all the MPs in Ontario, we got very, very little response indeed. Um, and so the campaign was also about when to let go, when, when to, you know, not keep banging your head up a closed, um, against the closed door. The Ontario Teachers Pension Fund were not interested in us. Um, and so we just stopped trying to influence them. The airport management were not interested in our arguments. We were not going to be able to change their minds. And so we stopped focusing our attention on them. And that um, and moved over towards um, the councillors. And when we moved over our, our focus towards the councillors, because this was a local um, council decision, this is local politics, then we were able to bring in a lot of more gratitude, love, understanding, education. Um, they became people, not airports. They were just 27 people now. And uh, so we, we, we felt like, oh yeah, well maybe we've got a chance if we make our arguments really good and we put enough pressure on them from, from their constituents, then maybe they will vote against this airport. Okay, that's, that's really great. And really great to see those pictures of the action. Seems like really colorful, creative way of yeah. targeting the people who are the the weaker links who we who we know can make that change at that local level yeah um, i'm going to um speak now to tim who has joined the call tim crosland who's part of the plan b group who um took heathrow airport to court um hi tim hi Andy. hi uh can you give everyone here an update on what's going on? We hear it going backwards and forwards. What's happening with the Heathrow ruling? So there will be a Supreme Court hearing. Um, that will be the 7th and the 8th of October, a two day hearing. Um, one of the interesting things about it is the government are, uh, are not appealing. So it's only um, Heathrow Airport Limited who are bringing the appeal. Um, there was another commercial party involved, um, Aurora Holdings Limited, they've decided not to appeal. So it will ultimately, it will be Heathrow Airport Limited against um, us, Plan B, and, and Friends of the Earth. Wow, so can you talk us about what the um, most recent, what, what the last ruling meant in, in accordance to the Paris Agreement and how, how we see these two how these two things intersect the airport expansion and this agreement that we made in 2008 that we wanted to keep the warming below 1.5 degrees sure yeah so i mean that was a ruling from the court of appeal on the 27th of february it seems a long long time ago because i don't think i've ever hugged so many people <laughs> as on that day outside courts um of every political persuasion everybody we had tory mps there you know concerned for them constituents um yeah it's just an amazing scene um and the fundamental point was it isn't okay for the government to keep telling us that they're committed to the paris agreement temperature limit while doing things that are obviously blatantly contradictory to that and so the court didn't didn't say and it didn't have to say um the government is bound by the Paris Agreement. It just said the government's got to be honest. It's got to, to take it into account. It's got to take into account its own policy on climate change 
and let us all know how this proposal relates to it. <laughs> because if it doesn't, you know, this is fundamentally undemocratic. Um, and I mean, I think it is is because the decision goes so much wider than just Heathrow, and could apply to you know more or less any he airport expansion in the UK beyond the UK. It's probably good just to to set a little bit of the legal background, but I don't want to get too technical. No, I think that would be great because um, Callum explained earlier in the call this Heathrow ruling, you know, that may stop Heathrow expansion, but almost every single airport in the UK has some sort of plans to expand its number of flights per year. So if you can give some tips to people watching about what you learned from that case and what might be applicable to local airport resistance. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, just, just one thing I would like to say, because we'd, we'd brought another case a bit earlier about the carbon target in 2017, before the activism really took off. And, you know, definitely you could feel the difference the activism had made, just in terms of the court's, you know, receptivity to the arguments. Um, you'd have judges in the Heathrow case saying, well, obviously, you know, this is a matter of huge public concern just a just a different approach so so it's really important to say that i think to point out that this was built in lots of ways on the work of all the activists um that court of appeal hearing um the hearing itself was in october and we didn't get the judgment till till february so actually while we were having that hearing it was mid october rebellion <laughs> and you know there are lots and lots of difficult things about october but it, it was really important that I think certainly that had some sort of an influence. But just to go back to, you know, the legal basis a little bit, um, there's this really important idea that, that um, all major planning decisions in the UK must proceed like in tandem with the government's climate change policy. So two bits of legislation were introduced in 2008 the Planning Act, which regulates major national planning decisions, and also the 2008 Climate Change Act. They were actually introduced in Parliament on the same day in November 2008. And there are provisions in the Planning Act that link across and say the government must take account of its own climate change policy when making planning decisions. There's a section in the Planning Act on sustainable development that says the Secretary of State before signing off a major national planning project must consider sustainable development, which means the impact on current and future generations and specifically look at climate change. So that, that's the sort of legislative backdrop we had. And then in 2018, Chris Grayling, you know, the, the, the legend now ex uh, transport minister, signed off a national policy statement in support of Heathrow expansion. And under the legislation, we had six weeks to bring a legal challenge. And it was quite clear, just looking at the documentation, that he hadn't really looked at the Paris 1.5, well below two degree temperature goal. And so that from the outset was the, the basis of our challenge, you know, keep it simple, hit on this point that, you know, fundamentally the government is being dishonest, not just in this, but nearly every uh, 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 major fossil fuel based, carbon based uh, national project. And it's trying to tell us that two and two makes five. And, you know, we know it doesn't. So just let's keep saying two and two doesn't make five and eventually something's going to give way. Um, so we began by saying you failed to take into account the Paris temperature limit. And the really extraordinary thing was Grayling began, or the government began their defense by saying, oh, actually we did. We did take account of the Paris temperature limit. And we said, okay, well, it doesn't really look like that because, you know, just add up the numbers here. It doesn't make sense. We all know what Paris means. It means urgent and radical decarbonisation. It definitely doesn't mean expanding one of the hardest to decarbonise sectors that there is. You know, just talk us through that. 
And then as the legal process progresses, the government has to disclose to us the witness statements of the civil servants who were making you know, the, the key policy decisions. And it became clear from those witness statements that they'd completely ignored the Paris Agreement, that they'd taken a conscious decision to ignore the Paris temp temperature limit and to work only with the historic Climate Change Act target of 80% uh, reductions by 2050. And so we had this moment, quite a dramatic moment in a pretrial hearing where the barrister for the government stood up and said, I must correct you know, what was said before. Um, I, I admit that the government did not take account of the Paris Agreement in making this decision. And you could just feel, you know, that was the moment. You could feel the judge, you saw the judge's eyebrow, <laughs> eyebrows rise. You really saying, Mr. Morici, that the government thought the Paris Agreement was irrelevant? And it's, I mean, this is the really, you know, mind boggling thing. If you think about what was at stake, if you think about the vast sums of money spent on this, you ask, well, how could, how could the government have made such a basic mistake? It feels like just a really simple sort of, you know, schoolboy error, doesn't it, to, to, um, um, to get that wrong. And the, the reason they got it wrong was because they knew they couldn't reconcile the two things. It was really hard to square Heathrow expansion, even with the 80% target. Roughly the Department of Transport's own figures showed that expanding Heathrow, even if you had no expansion for any other regional airports, would take aviation emissions to 40 million tonnes of carbon dioxide by 2050, which is greater than the planning assumption of 37.5 set by the Climate Change Committee. So they had to do all kinds of dodgy accounting, even to reconcile it with the 80% target. Mm -hmm. So they had to ignore Paris. <laughs> and and so, so I think that, you know, that's the heart of it. And that's something that can apply, you know, to, to lots of other situations, not just in aviation, but particularly aviation here and, and overseas. Yeah. So, um, so last question for you is if, if, what sort of tips do you have for people who are resist, who are, have heard of a new um, expansion project near them and they're interested in taking some sort of legal action? Has, has the Heathrow ruling set a precedent or will they find that because it's coming under local planning laws that, that it's going to, we're not going to be able to so easily illustrate, you promised us in 2008 that we were going to stay beneath this warming and I'm reminding you of this promise and asking you not to do it which is the kind of battle you've got here. Yeah, so I, do, I, want, I just want to be a little bit careful about encouraging people to, you know, charge off to call just because it's a big deal. And if you lose, there can be cost implications. So it's definitely something to think carefully about. But um, I, certainly this has potential in a local context as well, because once you've got that principle established, that you need to be looking at any airport's expansion against that 1.5 temperature limit. And you look at that in conjunction with the IPCC report about 1.5 means. You give everybody a problem and you can, you know, whether or not it comes within that particular 2008 legislation, you're saying obviously, you know, Bristol should be thinking about um, um, government policy on climate change. Obviously, they've got to show how this squares up with 1.5. Just two other really important things that came out of the ruling. Um, um, Callum talked a lot about non-CO2 emissions, uh, um, uh, nitrous oxide, and a really crucial point in the courts of appeal judgment, you must use the precautionary principle and think about the non-CO2 emissions as well. That's a really important point that people can use everywhere. Um, um, the emphasis on the precautionary principle really important as well. So the short answer is is do get some independent legal advice, but this can this can help um, everybody really. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Tim. Um, and Callum, can you speak um, a little bit about how how we can start mapping these um, projects and 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 your recent idea for for how we're going to do that? Yeah, sure. Um, so as as, as we yeah, we've been talking about, there's 
there's definitely a move kind of starting already that we've seen and, and more to come in terms of focus on regional expansion. And that's going to be harder for, for, for two main reasons. Heathrow was really, really easy. Well, not really easy, but it was, in, in a sense, the, the economic and environmental arguments were easier to, to kind of formulate that, you know, it was more expansion in London where there's lots of wealthy people already and it's economic development where we've already got it. And it was a, it's a massive carbon polluter, so it clearly is incompatible. And when we go to more regional battles with smaller airports, those get a bit more complex because the airlines will and, and, and the government and are likely to make arguments that this is to improve regional prosperity and development and and actually that that's a good thing to, to take the focus away from London and and you know, there are, there's reasons that regional growth could be really positive but that's not to say that it has to be an, an airport based expansion um, and on the environment point they're just smaller airports numerically and, and they're not necessarily one airport expansion is not necessarily going to blow our carbon budget single-handedly in the same way that that Heathrow would. So I think what what this what this means is that we need to come together and, and not be divided as a lot of local struggles fighting our local battles. Um, we need to to make sure that the voice of, of sort of people across the UK is is joined up and that we're sharing ideas and that we're talking to each other and actually just making clear that we're not just resisting Bristol and you know and Bradford and uh, Manchester airports but actually you know individually we're actually resisting across the board um, and that it's not a case of we want to you know we don't want it here but they're going to expand expand another one it's this kind of the French term uh, it's you know it's not here and not anywhere not a NIMBY fight and so we're basically looking in short at, at trying to starting with existing networks of local groups because there are some but really trying to build a broad coalition under a, 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 a national sort of stay grounded sort of chapter, as it were. So just trying to use this uh, the existing infrastructure that's there to build a to build a supportive network for all of us, basically. So we can all help each other to resist um, the, the, the airport expansion across the country. Um, that's great, Callum. So I suppose people will keep an eye on the stay grounded um, website to see updates on that. And um, Tarisha, um, uh, I'd like to hear your point. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd just like um, to come back on that, 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 that it's harder to argue for regional airports around the economic benefits and the um, carbon emissions. Um, so most, um, a lot of local um, governments have called a, a, um, an emergency, a climate emergency, and they've got local plan um, to make sure that they, that they, that, 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 that stays, that the carbon stays within that budget. So when we um, campaigned in, um, in Bristol, that was a legal um, um, argument that we gave and one which the councillors were really received. You know, obviously we've done a lot of lobbying, obviously we've done a lot of campaigning and education around these issues. Um, so we were able to make that legal argument. Whether we go for appeal, um, we're going to have to do that all over again, because again, um, we were, we're making a lot of relationships um, with people who are going to be making those decisions. Um, in terms of the economic benefits, well, the new education, um, new economic economics foundation completely pulled apart the economic argument for Bristol Airport um, twice. So once when they when the airport put their their, their assessment forward, the airport rebuffed their, their their analysis, and then the, and then they came back and explained again why that 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 it didn't add up for our local regional area so I, I i think these are you know they're not incredibly creative i mean i don't know in london whether that was different around the heathrow airport decision but what we found regionally is the arguments and the um time that they put 
forward is is based on an old paradigm of growth and self-interest and it's very it's very clear that that is the case um so you know we're human beings these people have families we we've been working on that on on that collective you know knowledge that collective unconscious or that hopefully collective conscious knowledge now that client you know we are in an emergency and we need to be doing something so i think it is all to play for in 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 derailing their economic assessment in every regional airport and especially now because it's covid's been and gone well been is it here is here Thank you, Tarisha. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. And I think everything you've said just really illustrates how we can go from hearing something, just feeling passionate, and then organising all of this ecosystem of people from people who want to organise on the computer to people who want to take legal action, people who want to paint massive banners and stand in the rain and get on top of planes. And I think all of these people working together, we really can start to see this huge shift and this huge change. Um, we have, we've just come to two o'clock, so um, I'll let people say a, a brief closing word and um, then, uh, then we'll, we'll be over and out um, to uh, James. Do you have something to say to people at home, last closing word? Yes, I think, I think we have to listen really carefully to the truth about aviation. It's one amongst many, many, many uh, areas that we need to address um, in order to tackle properly the climate and ecological crisis. Um, it's, there's so many things one can do. You know, you don't have to get on top of planes. We've heard of, you know, really great coordinated actions, lobbying of councillors, going through the legal channels. Whatever suits you, whatever you're inclined to get involved in, just get stuck in. We all need to work on this together. Great, thank you. Um, is there anything anyone else would like to say before we close the call? And Callum, I just um, yeah, just briefly. I think um, Trisha makes made some really good points there right at the end, and we have a, fan, a fantastic toolbox for local groups uh, that we just we yeah we all just need to bring it all together and 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 really make it work because I think we we're in a strong position to to resist the the aviation industry, especially right now when um when actually they're on the back foot and, and we've got to make a really strong case to make for, for limiting aviation so yeah i think there's all to play for and i think it's a really exciting time to get involved uh, so yeah stay tuned and let's get organizing Ter Teresha? Oh, no. yeah so thanks very much for uh, inviting um us here from bristol um there is so much to say um, about campaigning and, um, you know, we're very happy to talk to, um, we've, we're putting together a little bit of a booklet about how we managed to do this and the different, um, um, yeah, the different arguments we used for different um, material considerations that the, air, that the um, airport were putting forward. So if we were willing, really happy to share that with anybody. Thank you. Thanks. And Tim? Yeah, no, I just I think it is absolutely right that we're, we're winning the arguments and um, the industry's on the back foot in lots of ways. But just to emphasise, you know, it is some pretty tough opposition we've got. And the fact that we're winning, that isn't the time to, to take our, our, our foot off this. It's the time to step it up. And I really echo your calls, Indy, for, for working with this you know, wider ecosystem. I think that's what this call has illustrated um, so well. Okay, thanks to everyone listening at home um, and uh, yeah, get organising. Bye. <laughs>